History is filled with men and women who leave their marks on this world. The ruthless ones do it through conquest, the smart ones through science, the industrious ones through business, and the philosophical ones do it through their writings. One man, however, chose to leave his mark in a different way, magic. His impact in that world has been so strong that his name has almost become synonymous with the word magic itself. There is more to this character than meets the eyes, however. Magic alone was not enough to contain his personality. He was an inventor, a social organizer, an aviation pioneer, a marketing genius, a Hollywood star, and the world's first ghostbuster. This is the story of Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini was born in Budapest, the capital of Hungary, in 1874. His birth name was Eric Weiss and was born to a Jewish family. He was one of the seven children of Rabbi Samuel Weiss and Cecilia Steiner. In 1878, the family moved to the United States. Eric was four years old at the time. The area they moved to was Appleton, Wisconsin. Today, this city has a site named Houdini Square in his honor. Anyway, Houdini's father served as rabbi of a Jewish congregation in the Appleton community. But after losing his job, Rabbi Weiss relocated several times and ended up settling in New York City with his family. They lived in a boarding house on East 79th Street. As a child, Eric took several jobs to help his family. He sold newspapers, shined shoes, worked as a necktie cutter, etc. Eric had his first public debut at just nine years old. He worked as a trapeze artist, calling himself Eric the Prince of the Air. At around the age of 12, Eric and his brother Theo took an interest in magic. Four years later in 1890, Eric was 16 at the time, he changed his name to Houdini after reading the autobiography of French magician Robert Houdin. As for the first part of his name, he got it from Harry Keller, an American magician whom he also admired. Hence, Harry Houdini was born. As a teenager, Houdini was also coached by Joseph Wren, an American magician and skeptic of paranormal activity. We will see this influence play a role later in his life. Shortly after changing his name, Houdini formally began his magic career. He performed in dime museums, sideshows, tent acts, and even circuses. He initially focused on card tricks, at one point calling himself the king of cards. Although competent, Houdini was not exceptionally talented in that area. Other magicians said he lacked the soft finesse for this specialty. This lack of success led him to experiment with escape acts. In 1894, Houdini met a fellow performer while doing stage stunts with his brother in Coney Island. This performer was Beatrice Rana. She is also known as Bess. Bess would become Houdini's wife and stage assistant for the rest of his life. Houdini got a chance for the limelight in 1899 when he met Martin Beck, a booking agent and theater owner. Martin convinced Houdini to strictly focus on escape acts and book them at the Orpheum Circuit, a chain of vaudeville theaters that he owned. Houdini's performances were good, but were not quite yet a hit. The big break would come for Houdini when he left for Europe and use a brilliant marketing tactic. After escaping from a pair of handcuffs at the famous Scotland Yard Police Headquarters, he traveled city to city and challenged the local municipality to lock him up. He promised the officers that no matter what measures were taken, he would inevitably escape. Houdini was often stripped naked, tied to a pole, and locked behind a cell. He escaped every time. Not once did he fail to break free. 
even after a British locksmith from Birmingham locked them up with a special handcuff that had taken him five years to make. On top of this, Houdini would visit performances of his competitors. He would sit in the audience and challenge them to put on handcuffs Houdini himself had devised. After an hour or so, Houdini would leave them struggling to get out. This made it clear to everyone who the best escape artist was. Houdini's performances are so vast and numerous that for the sake of time, I will only focus on his most notable escapes. So here they are. The milk can escape is Houdini's most recognized stunt. The advertisement of this performance also hints at Houdini's marketing brilliance. The poster of this stunt proclaimed, Failure means a drowning death. Of course, such a risky claim gathered a large audience. In this act, Houdini is handcuffed and sealed inside an oversized milk can filled with water. As part of the effect, Houdini invites the audience to hold their breath along with him while he's inside the can. Few could exceed 60 seconds. Two minutes later, Houdini would emerge wet and out of breath in front of an amazed audience. Another of Houdini's signature stunt was the suspended straitjacket. In this performance, Houdini would be confined into a straitjacket and then be lifted and suspended by his ankles from a crane. It usually took Houdini 2 minutes and 37 seconds to completely free himself from the straitjacket while hanging upside down. This performance is so dangerous, brave and clever that the footage of this escape is archived in the Library of Congress. Houdini performed the first buried alive escape in Santa Ana, California in 1915, and it nearly cost him his life. Houdini was buried without a casket in a pit of earth six feet deep. While digging his way to the surface, he became exhausted and panicked. He even apparently called for help, but nobody heard him. When his hands finally broke the surface, he fell unconscious and was pulled out by his assistants. Houdini wrote in his diary that the escape was, quote, very dangerous and that the weight of the earth is killing, end quote. This did not stop him from performing this stunt two more times, however. On a side note, this buried alive stunt would cost magician Joe Bruce his life in Fresno, California, when he attempted to recreate Houdini's stunt. He was killed when seven tons of dirt and cement collapsed on his plastic coffin. No one knows whether this death was instant or a slow painful ordeal. In a strange twist of fate, the amazing Joe Bruce lost his life exactly 64 Halloweens from the day Houdini died. Other notable acts from Houdini are the Chinese water torture cell, and a stage act where he made a real-life elephant disappear in front of the audience. For most of his career, Houdini was a headline act in vaudeville. In fact, he was the highest paid performer for several years, making well over $10,000 per week when the numbers are adjusted for inflation. Outside of performing stunts, Houdini served as the president of the Society of American Magicians, an organization founded in 1902. The society expanded vastly under the leadership of Houdini. Wherever he traveled, he gave a formal address to the local magic club and threw them a banquet at his own expense. He convinced those local magicians to join the Society of American Magicians. The Buffalo Club joined as the first branch. Chicago was the third. Then came Detroit, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and so on. In places where no clubs existed, he rounded up individual magicians, introduced them to each other, and formed the branch. This was the biggest movement ever in the history of magic. In less than a decade, the Society of American Magicians became a united national network of professional and amateur magicians. Houdini began experimenting with film in 1906, only three years after Hollywood was incorporated. He would go on to produce several independent films, but his big break in that world came in 1918, when he was signed by Paramount Pictures, for whom he made two films, The Grim Game and Terror Island. For his early contributions to that community, Hollywood would honor Houdini by giving him a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Later, Houdini would put a halt to his acting and movie production career, complaining that the profits were too meager. In 1909, Houdini had become fascinated with aviation. He purchased a French biplane and began experimenting with flying. After crashing once, he made his first successful flight in Hamburg, Germany. America and Europe had already seen aviators fly over their sky, 
So Houdini went on a mission to make the first aerial flight in Australia. On March 18, 1910, Houdini made three flights at Diggeres, Victoria. It was reported at the time that this was the first aerial flight in Australia. But a century later, aviation experts argued that Wing Commander Harry Cobby had beat Houdini to the punch. The country of Australia, however, pays homage to both men as its aviation pioneers. Australia has given Houdini a stamp for his contribution to the aviation community. In 1913, Houdini's mother passed away after suffering a stroke. Houdini loved his mother deeply and tried to make contact with her several times through seances. After several failures, he turned his energy towards debunking psychics and mediums. Part of this new career path came from the disappointments in trying to connect with his mother in the afterlife. But another part of it came from the influence of Joseph Rin, the magician who coached him in his early years. Houdini's training in magic allowed him to expose frauds who had successfully fooled many scientists and academics. He became a Sherlock Holmes of sorts, but in a spiritual realm. In other words, Houdini was the first ghostbuster. He attended seances in disguise, accompanied by a reporter and a police officer. He debunked many famous mediums like Mira Cranden and Joaquin Hamasilia. Houdini chronicled his debunking exploit in his book, A Magician Among the Spirits, a must-read for magic fans. On October 20th, 1926, Houdini visited McGill University and gave students a presentation on his recent debunking of a Boston medium. Later on, after the presentation, two students came to visit him, Gordon Whitehead, and Samuel Smilovitz. During this meeting, Whitehead asked Houdini if it was true that his stomach could handle any blow. Houdini replied that his stomach can take a lot. Without warning, Whitehead delivered several terrific blows to Houdini's stomach. The result of these blows is where stories differ. Some say that these punches aggravate an existing but undetected case of appendicitis. Others believe that the punches were in fact what caused the appendicitis. One thing that we do know for sure is that Houdini would die one week later, on Halloween. His planted grave can be found in Queens, New York, and is open to the public. Those of you who want to pay your respects to the great magician can save this location on a Cityscape app. Houdini's death is as mysterious as his life. Today, his gravesite is maintained by the Society of American Magicians. Houdini had not only willed a large sum of money to the organization, but had grown it from one club in New York City to over 300 assemblies worldwide. It's funny, Houdini took care of them while alive, and they take care of him now that he's dead. It seems like what we give is what we get. After Houdini died, his wife tried to connect with his spirit. Despite his skepticism about the spirit world, he swore to his wife Bess that if he died, he would try to contact her from beyond the grave. He told her to listen for a specific message. The code was, Rosabelle believe. Bess would spend a decade trying to contact her late husband before giving up saying, 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. Others would continue to search however. Houdini fans hold seances every Halloween in an attempt to connect with the magician's ghosts. There's even an official seance that takes place in a different city every year. Now that's a cool secret spot. Harry Houdini was larger than life. Chains and handcuffs are not the only things that he escaped from. He escaped from fear. He escaped from poverty, he escaped from gravity, he escaped from superstition, but most importantly, he escaped from selfishness. See you next time.